O God, you are our God. Eagerly we seek you this night. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> The readings for this second Sunday after the Epiphany present to us the theme of our vocation or our call as Christians. It is firstly described in today's Old Testament lesson from the first book of Samuel, the third chapter. Thus we have heard read the evocative story of the vocation of the prophet whom God called by name, wakening him from his sleep initially three times. At first, the young Samuel does not understand where this mysterious voice calling him comes from. It is only on the fourth interruption, and thanks to the explanation of the elderly priest Eli, that Samuel discovers that what he has heard is the actual voice of God. Therefore, he then replies immediately, as we'd read in verse 10, and the Lord came and stood, calling as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. We can say that Samuel's call serves as a, as a prototype, if you will, since it is the completion of a process that is repeated in the vocation of every person of the Christian faith. God's voice, in fact, is heard in each case with increasing clarity and the subject gradually acquires an awareness of its divine origin. With time, the person called by God learns to be increasingly open to the word, ready to listen and to do his will in their own lives. The account of Samuel's vocation in the context of the Old Testament corresponds in a certain sense to what St. John writes about the vocation of the original disciples in the New Testament. In particular, the author of the fourth gospel enables us to understand more thoroughly the vocation of the very first apostles, that is, the calling of the brothers, Andrew and Simon, by Jesus Christ as is recorded in the first chapter of John's Gospel, the seven verses that precede what Deacon Stomberg read for us, verses 35 through 42. If you would please let me read them to you. The next day, after the baptism of Jesus, again John the Baptist was standing with two of his disciples, and he looked at Jesus as he walked by, and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, What are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Jesus said to them, Come, and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which means Christ. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at Simon and said, You are Simon, son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter or rock. So in this brief 
but solemn description of the vocation of Jesus' first disciples, this theme of seeking and finding is foremost. The attitude of Andrew and Simon, the two brothers, shows that desire for the fulfillment of the prophecies, which was an essential part of the Old Testament faith. Israel was waiting for the promised Messiah. He who was being sought more zealously than ever after John the Baptist began to preach on the banks of the Jordan River. The Baptist not only announced the imminent coming of the Messiah, but identified his presence in the person of Jesus of Nazareth, who had come to the Jordan to be baptized in order, as he said, to fulfill all righteousness. The call of the first apostles took place precisely in this context. That is, it sprang from John the Baptist's faith in the Messiah, now present among the people of God. Today's responsorial refrain from Psalm 61, the first verse, O God, you are my God, eagerly I seek you, also speaks of the Messiah's coming into the world. When the fullness of time had come, this presence of the Messiah, announced by God through the Old Testament prophets, became an historical reality in the mystery of the Incarnation. Having only recently liturgically completed the Christmas season, a time of joyful festivity over the Savior's birth, we all still have before our eyes, I hope, and in our hearts, the celebration of that fulfillment of the messianic prophecies surrounding those incredible events in the little town of Bethlehem. After the Christmas season, the liturgy of Mother Church now shifts gears to show us the gradual beginning of Jesus' saving mission through the simple and direct accounts of the apostles' vocations. And exactly what was the vocation of the apostles? Well, it really isn't that complicated. To share with all nations, Matthew says, the gospel, the good news of God in Christ. That is that God himself in Jesus has reached out to us personally he became one of us. He was crucified and rose from the dead and calls us to share in his life forever. Sisters and brothers, I urge you with all my heart to take this joyful news to those who are not with us here tonight. Take it to your families. Take it to your professional colleagues, people who are alone, the elderly, the sick. Offer everyone the good news of the gospel so that like the Apostle Andrew, they just might be able to say one day, I have found the Messiah. Now, beloved, when we follow the thought that St. Paul expresses in our second reading tonight from the sixth chapter of his first letter to the Corinthians, our focus on Christian vocation and calling opens to an even deeper dimension. And thus, Paul's words deserve special reflection Though my guess is most preachers won't touch this today with a hundred-foot pole. 
As we have read, St. Paul writes this to the church in Corinth. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Yes, the Holy Spirit is present in each one of us. And we have received the gift of the Spirit from the Father. God who calls the baptized to his service and assigns to each regenerate believer a task has the fundamental right to do so. He doesn't need anyone's permission. He alone has this right because he is the creator and the redeemer of each of us. If he calls us, if he invites us to follow in a given way, he does so in order that we will not cause his work to disappear, in order that we may respond with our own lives to the gift received from him, in order that we may live in a manner worthy of those who are a temple of the Holy Spirit, in order that we may be able to carry out that specific duty which he entrusts to each one of us. Paul, as only Paul can do, wants to make the Corinthians clearly aware of this truth. Christians, body and soul, in their entirety, belong to God and God alone. Firstly, because each of us are one of his children, but more especially because we have been redeemed from sin through Christ. To become aware of this means to reach the very roots of the vocation of all the baptized. Precisely because we have been redeemed by Christ and become the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit, every Christian can find the various talents and charisms that allow to develop one's life creatively to glorify God in all circumstances. We are thus able to serve God and our brothers and sisters suitably responding to our unique callings in the Christian community and in the social context in which we live and work. I sincerely hope that you are all aware of the dignity of your Christian vocation. Attentive to the voice of God who calls and that you are willingly generous in proclaiming his saving presence to those to whom he puts within the fabric of your daily life. The local congregation is the very environment in which must be heard the call that God addresses to every Christian. It is here we will accept and realize it, and will certainly be helped in that life we're called to live through the lively faith collectively of the entire Christian community. A life of faith by God's plan has its beginning in the nuclear family. Dynamically integrated into the church and which develops continually from the moment we died in the waters of baptism into our meeting with Christ in death face to face. It logically follows, therefore, the principle of the close collaboration 
between God's plan for the family and the church universal, who together cooperate in the formation of the responsible and mature Christian, of which the world is sadly lacking in quality and quantity. Within this context, each member of the congregation must put to oneself responsibly the fundamental question of his or her own Christian existence. What does God want me to do for him? It may be the call to a given profession, which puts one in the service of others and of society, or the vocation to family life by the means of the sacrament of holy matrimony, or the call for some to exclusive service of God, as happened, as we are reminded tonight, in the case of Samuel and Andrew and Simon Peter. But the fact is, the whole life of a Christian is a vocation, which embraces the different stages of existence and gives a meaning to the various situations, even to persecution, suffering, illness, and old age. A Christian must always, in all circumstances, be able to repeat with faith and with conviction the words of the young Samuel, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. May this moving and generous readiness to accept God's call be always present at Holy Communion Anglican Church, allowing us to continue forming a living and cohesive Christian community, joyful and proud to be able to say yes to Christ in a reticent world. Jesus is our liberator, amen? This title of Christ is a significant one. Christians very much cherish freedom, but simultaneously we often do not know how to use freedom correctly. Often the wrong use of freedom results in our losing it, and we cease to be free. Christ teaches us the good and perfect use of freedom. St. Paul was particularly aware of this when he wrote to the church in Galatia, the fifth chapter, the first verse. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand fast, therefore. This great work, Christ the Liberator, wishes to carry out in each one of us gathered here tonight. So dear brothers and sisters, God in Christ will help us to discover the divine good which freedom contains. He will help us to make the best use of freedom. He is the great I Am who liberates not by means of power as the world knows it, but by the means of unconditional love. So let us say with confidence tonight, speak, Lord, because we, your servants, are ready to listen to you. For God, You are our God. Eagerly we seek you tonight.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.